All right, why don't we get started? Good afternoon. My name is John Denny. I'm a research professor here at the U.S. Army War College. I work specifically over at the Strategic Studies Institute, which is the research arm of the War College. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all here that are in the room with us here at the War College. Also, those of you watching in the seminar rooms, as well as our virtual audience watching online. I want to remind those virtual audiences, uh, both watching through the internet and back in your seminar rooms, that when we get to the Q&A, you can tweet your questions to us, to us by using the hashtag EU security, all one word, hashtag EU security. It's my honor today to welcome uh, Dr., uh, my friend, Dr. Sven Biskup. Uh, Sven is currently the director of the Europe in the World program at the Egmont Institute, that is the Royal Belgian Institute for International Relations in Brussels. His research focuses on defense, security, and foreign policies of the UN, the EU, and its member states. He earned his, political science, his PhD in political science from the University of Ghent, where he currently teaches. He's a member of the executive academic board of the EU's European Security and Defense College, a senior research associate at the Center for European Studies at the People's University in Beijing, and a member of the Strategic Advisors Group at the Atlantic Council in Washington, D.C. He co-edits Global Affairs, that's the Journal of the European Stu International Studies Association, and he's editor-in-chief of Egmont's own journal, Studia Diplomatica. Our prolific writer himself, Sven, is most recently the author of Peace Without Money, War Without Americans, Can European Strategy Cope? Got a copy of that here. I also have a flyer. Uh, those of you that are in the room that are interested in purchasing this book, or want to consider doing that, there are flyers in the back and you can get a discount by picking up one of those flyers. So we've invited Sven to uh, join us here at the War College today to talk about the EU's ongoing efforts to update its security strategy. Uh, as many of you may know, the EU is in the midst of doing that right now uh, to be completed by June 2016. And so this is an appropriate time, given what's going on around the world, to, uh, to invite Sven to talk to us about what we might expect to see in that strategy, what uh, we might hope to see in that strategy, uh, the impact, for example, of Russia's actions in Ukraine, uh, of ISIS in the Levant, and of course, most recently in, in Paris, and what role military capabilities and capacities might play in that strategy. So without further ado, let me turn the floor over to Dr. Sven Biscuit. Sven, the floor is yours. John, thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, many thanks for setting this up. And uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen in the audience for uh, making the effort, because I understand you actually had a day full of lectures already. So it's much appreciated that you want to uh, sacrifice yourselves and, and do one more, um, especially since I know that Belgians are not necessarily known as great makers of strategy. We're usually the subject of someone else's strategy. I mean, <laughs> our, our strategic niche is rather to provide convenient battlefields um, to, our, to our neighbors which is why we are genetically predisposed or have become so to favor cooperation among, uh, among our neighbors. We rather have people talking each other to death in EU and NATO meeting rooms than fighting each other, uh, fighting each other to death. Um, I was in, 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 in Washington just yesterday where uh, the team that is drafting the future EU global strategy on foreign and security policy organized a seminar to also get some input uh, from the United States. Uh, NSC and, and State Department and so on. Um, so we're really in, in, in the early phase of this, uh, of this process in which I'm involved informally as an, uh, as an academic. And I should probably, probably say for the record that the Egmond is the Royal Institute for International Relations closely linked to our Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It's not a part of the ministry. So whatever I'm about to say can and probably will be used against me, but should not be held against the kingdom, <laughs> which has problems enough of its own, uh, as you know, and I, I don't want to add to them. Um, usual three points. I want to say something about um, the existing strategy that we have, the 2003 European security strategy, what we want to preserve from it, but what we might want to change. Uh, secondly, maybe a few words about uh, the process, and then thirdly on the substance of what the new strategy could say, would say, and then I look forward to, to, debating, um, to debating with you. First of all, the current strategy, well, it dates back to 2003. Obviously, it needs to be uh, updated. That, that's quite clear. Uh, I think just of all the uh, updates that 
the, the 2002 National Security Strategy of the United States, to which our strategy was more or less a reaction. How often that's been updated uh, since. NATO has a new strategic concept. Many individual EU member states have a new strategy. In fact, the UK will produce, will announce its new strategy in the coming weeks or so. So it's about time that we do the same. But it doesn't mean that we have to start from a blank sheet of paper. I think the core idea or ideas of the 2003 document remain valid. The challenge is rather to, to turn that I those ideas into a driver of actual decision making and to do some prioritizing. And that, that is, I think, where the EU has been, has been lacking a little bit. I usually summarize the existing strategy, the 2003 one, by quoting just one sentence from it, which says, the best protection for Europe's security is that we would have a world of well-governed democratic states. And I think that still holds true, because if we look at all the crises around us, they usually emerge from not very well-governed, not very democratic states. And so that, that big idea, I think, remains valid. A well-governed democratic state, that means a state that provides for all of its people security, freedom, you know, a stake in decision-making, protection of their human rights, the rule of law, but also prosperity that gives all of its citizens an equitable share, a fair share of the prosperity that a country produces. A country that takes care of its own citizens that way usually is much less the cause of problems for other countries than any, than any other else. The question is, though, how, how do you get there? You know, this is, in a way, a very idealist strategy. Um, but we have probably been, been over-ambitious or over-optimistic in, in thinking how fast we would get to this world of well-governed democratic states. And I think the lesson learned from the last 12 years is that from the outside, it's very difficult to engineer reform if it is not happening from the inside. That is very difficult to, to trigger it. If a state, a society is not changing in itself, and from the outside, maybe you can aspire to a, a moderating impact, trying to moderate any excesses with uh, as measures of last resort, you uh, different forms of coercion, diplomatic, economic, and eventually the use of force. Um, but you're not going to impose a well, well, good governance and democracy. It just doesn't work, I'm afraid. Um, but if it does happen from the inside, then you can try to amplify it and steer it in the right direction. So I think the EU, we somehow need to find a new balance. On the, We need to reposition ourselves on this continuum between idealism with a big I and realism with a big, with a big R. And we need to also make it clear that this is not just about ideals, but also about European interests. And this, I think, sounds obvious to an American audience, but it is not to a European audience. For a long time, it was as if European strategy, European foreign policy was only there to do good in the world. And, and interest was a bit of a dirty wor word, even. That, that is changing. Uh, that is very much changing, but, but only now, only slowly. So I think somehow, you know, um, one of the American colleagues yesterday said, if you write a new strategy, make sure to invent your own bumper sticker. Because if you don't, someone else will do it for you, and it might not be one that you like. So my bumper sticker is pragmatic idealism. You need to keep an, a long-term ideal, because that gives you a sense of direction. But you have to know that the road to, to reach that will be long, arduous, and, and with, many, uh, with many turns. We need to be more pragmatic in how we do that. That doesn't mean that the EU or Europeans have the aspiration to begin to do classic power politics, because we think that doesn't work. Um, we, we still believe that the best protection of our interest is by promoting our values, meaning security, prosperity, and freedom, in a word, equality. Those countries that treat their citizens equally are the most stable, stable countries. And that is, in a way, what makes Europe Europe. It's this aspiration to, to equality, that everybody should have a stake, a fair stake, also in the economic prosperity that Europe um, Europe produces. Um, and so we don't want to... The answer, for example, to Mr. Putin is not to become more like Mr. Putin. Because if you look more closely on it, Russia is not so successful in, in, in the strategy that it's currently pursuing. Um, certainly in the media, Putin is always portrayed as the master strategist. But I would say he's a master tactician. He's very good at playing off um, one country against another. He's very good at pushing 
just far enough to put us to put us off balance, but not so far that that the the, the way to react would be obvious. That we always stay clearly under the threshold of Article Five, for instance. But what has he achieved? Actually, he is still very much on the defensive. In the Ukraine, he has gained the Crimea, but the only thing that matters on the Crimea is the Navy base, on which he had a guaranteed lease already. He has gained the enclaves in, in the east of the country, but as a result, he has pushed the big majority of the country in towards Europe and the United States, which is exactly the opposite of what he wanted, uh, actually. In Syria, he was about to lose his influence, because if the Assad regime were toppled, uh, he would lose, there was a big chance he would lose uh, the Navy base and so on. He's actually, he was making the same mistake that he made in Ukraine. He was, so he was putting all his eggs in one basket to the very end. Only in, 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 in Syria, Putin could count on a very clever Assad who, who calculated rightly that, that ISIS would be seen as a much bigger threat uh, to us, to Europeans and Americans, uh, than he himself. And by now inserting himself there, uh, Putin has made it uh, obvious that Assad will have to be a part of any power deal. But he is not gaining anything. He's trying to defend what he had. So I think we still feel in Europe that classic power politics, that, that they, don't, they don't work. The way to, to defend our interests is not by creating spheres of influence. The way to defend our interests is rather to ensure that, for example, all of our neighbors can make their own choices in all freedom. If Ukraine or another country in all freedom chooses to align more with Russia than with us, well, fine. If that's their free choice, fine. But if in all freedom they choose to align also with us, we don't seek exclusivity, and if they, they move towards more good governance, more democratization, then we also want them to have the freedom to make, to make that choice. I think that's a kind of, let's say, the big idea that, that Europeans um, stick to. Now, a few words about... about um, process and, and the scope of the strategy. Um, the aim of European foreign and security policy is not to replace the foreign and security policy of the individual member states. It's rather to complement them. So the aim of the strategy is not to say something about everything. You know, of course, the EU must have an opinion about organized crime in Colombia and, and nuclear disasters in Japan and everything in between. Uh, but if you want to know, find that out, you, know, you can go to the EU website. And you know, there, there's a page on everything. Um, that, that is not the strategy. The, the, the aim is exactly to, to prioritize. So I think the, what we should do is focus, and the consensus is emerging, is, is to focus the, that big idea now, and focus the, take that same big idea, but focus on, on the limited number of priorities. Tease out a number of issues that are so big that they're important for all 28 members, but also so big that no single member can deal with them alone. This is where we can prove that the EU level really has added value. It's in a way the, the issues on which you can prove that the EU can be better at defending your national interest than you yourself, because you no longer have the means. Um, so that means that the strategy should also be more operational. The 2003 strategy is a good document. It's the first time ever that the EU produced a strategic document, but it's not a very operational document. Um, of course, grand strategies like this, I mean, just like the, the national security strategy, this is not the kind of document that, that when you arrive in the office in the morning, you can open and it tells you what you have to do today. It has to be operationalized into sub-strategies and policies, etc. But that's where the EU was lagging behind. We didn't really have a follow-up mechanism. Um, so we need to make it more operational. We need to force the system, the EU machinery, to keep using this strategy as its guidelines. The 2003 document, I think, had real impact on EU decision-making for two or three years, and then it fizzled out because there was no institutional necessity for the administration to, to go back to it. One thing that is, is very likely to happen, therefore, is that in the new strategy, they will put a sunset clause. They will say, this is a strategy for, for example, the next five years. That would make sense. Just like here, every US administration produces a new national security strategy. I think every five years, after every European election, we should have another look at our, um, at our grand strategy. I would also advocate to use the strategy more as a mandate for action, to that, that the High Representative, Federica Mongherini, can use it to mandate herself and create 
margin of maneuver for herself, to give herself more right of initiative vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis the capitals. Um, so I think on all of these, these few big topics, we should say, in this term, what, what's the objective? What's the end state that we would seek to achieve? Um, get then give some indication on substance. To achieve that, which of the existing instruments has to be revised, or which new instruments have to be developed? Which kind of means do we need for that? And then give a tasking to the relevant body within the system and say, Deve develop me a proposal by this date and report back to the highest political level to make sure that, that the system keeps, um, keeps, working, uh, keeps working on it. Of course, it will always be a complicated system. I suppose <coughs> in the end, the foreign policy of the United States is what the president says that it is. Um, in, in the EU, um, you always have to agree between 28 capitals because foreign policy remains an entirely intergovernmental area, meaning all decisions are taken by unanimity. So no high representative can make foreign policy against the capitals. They have to make it with the capitals. You know, there's always this, uh, everybody keeps repeating Henry Kissinger's joke about Europe, well, what's the phone number? But Henry Kissinger had only one Nixon to deal with. You know, Any EU high representative has 28 of them. Uh, they might not all be as notorious as Nixon, but, but still, it will never be, never be easy as long as we stick with voting by, um, by unanimity. So how will the process develop? Uh, Mogherini got her mandate in June from the European Council, so the heads of state and government, uh, on the basis of an analysis that she made of the environment. So the first part of the strategy, the threat analysis, that's already done. That's already a public document from June. And now they started a very broad consultation phase, kicked off in, in Brussels in early October, uh, where they the, the, the EU itself is actively organizing a series of seminars on different topics that are of interest to the strategy, making sure, of course, that they all do these in different capitals, but also capitals and universities and think tanks can propose events, and if they are just interesting, then they will become officially part of the consultation uh, process. This phase will uh, uh, last until March, and then the drafting team will do the actual the actual writing. Um, the drafting team is small, that, that's the idea. It, it has people from the different bits of the EU machinery, five or six, and interestingly it's chaired by someone from outside the system. Mogherini took uh, uh, an academic, uh, Natalie Tocci is an Italian academic, a scholar, and put her in charge of the drafting process. And I think that makes good sense because one, she does not have any particular institutional interest to defend in this, just have to try to defend the European Commission against the European Council or whatever. Um, and as an outsider, she can be a bit that bit more daring and uh, creative, uh, I dare say. Of course, while these seminars are happening, they are consulting member states on a very regular basis at different, different levels. Um, all member states have been asked to appoint a point of contact. They sit in the foreign ministries, and this group uh, meets every month, but apart from that, they have consultations at ministerial level, uh, security or defense policy directors level, the ambassadors in Brussels, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Perhaps even a little bit too much uh, consultation um, sometimes. And then finally, in June, we should see uh, the new um, the new strategy. So that's a process that is ongoing. the The outreach seminar here was the first one outside Europe, uh, but I think maybe a few more might follow, and I think we should actually also consult other countries that are not necessarily allies, you know. I would do one in Beijing and go and listen what the Chinese have to say. Why not, um, for example? Now, in my, in my turn and last part, let me just say a few words about what I think are the big topics that an EU strategy should deal with and just offer a few words on, on each of them. To be brief as on the first one, a multilateral agenda. The 2003 document was very big on what it called effective multilateralism, creating a rules-based international order. But the EU has dropped that ball a little bit. But everybody else, all the other global actors, they are taking many multilateral initiatives. The Chinese, with the uh, Asian Infrastructure and Development Bank, for example. The United States. I think in the 1500s, the Pope divided the world into the Portuguese sphere of influence and the Spanish sphere of influence. Now the US is dividing the world into TTIP and TPP. <coughs> Are we sure in Europe that this is entirely in our interest? I have my doubts about it. But just to make the point, 
everybody else is having is trying to change the multilateral system at the global level and at the regional level, I don't see a, a European point of view. I don't see a European agenda. And I think we, we need that because it's really in our interest that multilateral institutions work. Um, that also includes reforming the existing multilateral institutions where we Europeans and Americans are still overrepresented. And I think if we don't want to push the, the emerging powers out of the existing system, we have to make more space for them in the system. I mean, to give you one example, in, in the international financial institutions, Belgium still holds more votes than China. I mean, you and I are convinced of the genius of the Belgian people, but <laughs> still, there's a little <laughs> imbalance. Maybe that should be Belgian peoples, plural, but that's another discussion. Um, so that, that, that's one, one big topic that I would, I, I would focus on. Secondly, and I'm probably obviously, the European neighborhood policy. I would start by saying you cannot have one single neighborhood policy, as we have pretended. Uh, we have to have a neighborhood policy at least for the east and one for the south. And, and they operate completely differently for the simple reason that our eastern neighborhood is in Europe and our southern neighborhood is not. Which means that the basic idea of the security strategy in the neighborhood policy worked in the east. We basically say the more you become well-governed democratic states. In other words, the more you become like us, EU, the more closer relations with us you will have and the more money you will get. And in Eastern Europe, they say, yeah, th that actually resonates with a large part of public opinion. I mean, people in Ukraine, in Kiev, came out into the streets to demonstrate for closer association with the EU. And I wish people in London would do that, you know, but, um, well, they are, they're, they're in hiding. Uh, th those who are in favor of, of more EU. So I think the problem with our, with our neighborhood policy in the East is not that it didn't work. The problem is that we, we, we began to see it as a completely technocratic process and we disregarded the geopolitical implications of it. And that's why Russia's reaction to, to our attempt to forge <coughs> close relations with Ukraine, that's why, why this surprised us. Um, there's this great quote from Bomber Harris, you know, Sir Arthur Harris, who commanded RAF Bomber Command in the war, and he published his memoirs. And it's about the Germans, but it applies to the EU today. And he says, he says the Germans will never make small mistakes, because their entire training prepares them not to make small mistakes, and all their manuals prepare them for it, and they will never do anything without the manual. But he goes on, you can always count on them, to make all the big catastrophic mistakes. And that's how we won the war. And this is the story of the neighborhood policy. I mean, at the technical level, it was perfect. They rolled out the commission, the trade people, they rolled out the entire action plan, the trade negotiations, like they've done it hundreds of times, and it went perfect. No small mistake was made, except the one catastrophic mistake that, of course, this is not just a trade policy issue. This is about geopolitics and spheres of influence in the Russian in the Russian side, and we have to be aware of that. So I think the question for the Eastern Neighborhood Policy is now, would we be willing to make the same efforts that we're making for Ukraine for another country there? I think for Moldova, the answer is already yes. What about Belarus? The question is not now on the table, but history shows us that regimes like this, if they crumble, they crumble very fast, very unexpectedly. So the question could be on the table before we know it. What about the three countries of the Southern Caucasus, Armenia, Georgia, Azerbaijan? Do we really know what Europe's interests are in there, what our leverage is? Some people claim we should begin to, uh, that we should extend our Eastern neighborhood policy to Central Asia, to the stands. Are we sure of that? What are our interests? We know definitely, and that's interesting, China is moving into there massively. One belt, one road strategy. It'll be interesting to see how Mr. Putin regards this intrusion in what according to him is also his fear of influence, and how long China can maintain its benevolent neutrality in the Ukraine crisis once it really starts moving into Central Asia. But what is the EU's role there? That's an undecided question. In the South, I think our neighborhood policy has failed completely, because we never did it. We, instead of supporting those who became more well-governed, more democratic, we supported anybody, as long as they followed our agenda on migration, on terrorism and energy. The result is that all the people whom we declared our friends, Mubarak, um, Ben Ali, Gaddafi, they were the ones who are, were toppled. And so our, um, our legitimacy is at an all-time low. So I think for the southern neighborhood, we need to start almost from a blank sheet of paper. And we need to define a different kind of relationship. 
we need to probably get away from the dictatorship of partnership. There is this tendency in Europe to declare everybody a partner. I mean, it, uh, it's very difficult to find a single country in the world that is not somehow officially a partner of the EU, maybe North Korea. Um, but the problem is that then we believe in our own rhetoric. And, and, and of course, many of these countries are not really partners, because for me, with a partner, it means that you, you share a sufficient degree, you have a sufficient agreement on, on foreign policy objectives and what are legitimate ways of pursuing them, not just to talk, but to also act together uh, occasionally. That's not really the case for many of our neighbors in the South. Many of them are quite authoritarian regimes. And so instead of inciting them to reform by declaring them all partners, rather we ourselves have become tainted because we have become uh, seen as being as associating too closely with all kinds of not very uh, nice, nice regimes. So I think we need some kind of new arrangement. Which brings me to my third and final point also. You cannot have a comprehensive neighborhood policy if, this, if it does not include security. You cannot say I have a great grand plan for the Mediterranean and the Middle East, but it stops where security problems begin. So I think and that's maybe the key question also is what the, the, the new strategy should define what are the key security responsibilities that Europeans think are so important that they will always have to assume them. No matter under which flag, EU, NATO, ad hoc coalition, that's a secondary question, but that Europeans will always have to assume, if necessary, alone, if nobody else is willing or able to help us, if necessary, alone. Um, I see three respon uh, I see a set of, of four responsibilities. One, to ensure the internal and the border security of the European Union. That's, of course, very much on the agenda now after, after the attacks in Paris of last week. Two, we must take the lead in stabilizing our own broad neighborhood, east and south, because nobody else is automatically going to do it for us. This means, I think, that when problems are occurring in our neighborhood, the EU is the best place to analyze it, to understand what is happening, to decide, is it important for us? And if so, to decide what has to be done and to forge a coalition that can do it. Three, we have to contribute to the freedom of the global commons, space, cyberspace, maritime security, worldwide, of course, in a leading role in maritime security, for example, in our broad neighborhood, in a contributing role at the global level. And I think, fourth, we still have a major responsibility in upholding the collective security system of the United Nations even deploying in areas that are not of direct interest to Europe. Think of the EU operation in the Central African Republic, where no member state except for France had specific interests. You know. As one of my colleagues always says, the only thing that the Central African Republic has going for it is that its name tells you where it is. <laughs> Otherwise, people would probably not know, not know even that. Now, this is a very tricky part of the debate because because in a way, you have to take decisions in an EU document that also have implications for NATO. I think there is, if Europeans want to together to make grand strategy, and by grand strategy, I mean strategy that covers the whole spectrum of external action of foreign policy, trade, aid, diplomacy, and defense, there's only one place where we can do that, and that's the European Union, because only the European Union covers that spectrum. But the hard security part of it, implementing it, the command and control structures for it are for a large part located outside the EU, of course. They're in NATO. So can we accept that we make grand strategy in Europe in the full knowledge that implementing it on the hard security side will often have to be done through NATO? So in a way also accepting that part of NATO's role is to be an instrument at the service of EU grand strategy. That, that makes this debate uh, very much complicated in an institutional way. But think about the opposite. Would you really want to limit an EU strategic debate to that part of, high of hard security that could be the subject of a CSDP operation? I mean, given the record of what CSDP, EU commanded operations, have done so far, that, that would be a smallish, a smallish debate. And I don't see if you want to, we need to have a, a debate as Europeans about, I repeat, what we need to be able to do alone if necessary. That's a debate we can never have in NATO. Any debate in NATO will eventually always be about American strategy. So I'm not saying this to, do, to, uh, to, to c arrive at a strategy that, that goes against US or NATO strategy, but I'm thinking it's absolutely necessary that we define as ourselves 
also what is the level of ambition of this European bloc, this group of European states who are the European allies and partners in NATO slash EU member states. That bloc, regardless of the flag under which they operate, what should they be able to do? And then that needs to be translated into military requirements um, that allow for autonomy, to create a capability mix that allows us to contribute to NATO's collective defense, to contribute to the internal security of the EU and the border security, and to undertake expeditionary operations with or without non-European NATO allies. And I think at least in our own neighborhood, we should be able, if necessary, not for the fun of it, but if necessary, to undertake major peace enforcement operations alone. I mean, to give an example, the Libya Air Campaign 2011, we really should have been able to do that alone, if necessary. And this means then that we need to develop our own strategic enablers, yeah. the enablers for which until now we always have to rely on the, on the United States. So this is sort of my uh, wish list. Um, I tell this uh, to anybody who is uh, listening in Brussels. That's my husband and, my, and one or two colleagues, I think. Uh, not even my mom, she lives out of town. Um, but I think, I think there's, a con there's an awareness growing in Europe, a consensus is growing, that we need something more operational, more interest-based, and something, you know, rather than always asking, you know, how, how can you reassure us, but rather asking what can we bring to the table, what can we uh, contribute. Voila, I, I rest my case uh, here, and I will happily pretend that I have the answer to all of your questions. Sven, thank you so much. Those are great insights. You've given us a lot of uh, food for thought and fodder for q and I'm going to start, though, by asking you uh, about the D in the CSDP specifically. Yeah. You mentioned that uh, one of the security responsibilities should be for stabilizing uh, crises or uh, let's call them challenges perhaps in the east and the south and it seems clear that the eu has done that and that washington's been content to let the eu do that with regard to russia for example in ukraine uh chancellor merkel seems to me to be uh i think the perception in washington is she's in the lead and rightfully so uh, as long as uh uh, she can bring along most of the European allies or the other EU states with her, then the U.S. is content with that situation for now. But let me tie this back to what you said at the outset of your presentation about the lofty goals of the EU strategy and whether or not the EU strategy has room in it for a policy toward Russia that is perhaps not as idealistic as it might have been in the previous version. What is your sense of the thinking now in Brussels and throughout the EU on where we go from here. There's much in the media now and just in the last couple of days about this potential rapprochement between the Russians and the West over the common fight, quote unquote common fight, in Syria and Iraq, right? But it seems to me that there are many, in, uh, certainly in Washington and perhaps in, other, uh, in the EU capitals and among other NATO allies, who are not ready to return to any kind of business as usual with the Russians. What's, what's your sense of that? I, I mean, I think we should not forget that in relations with, between great powers, you always compartmentalize. And it has always been the practice that you work together on one topic, even while you vehemently disagree on another. And already before now that Russia's involvement in, in Syria, we negotiated with the Russians on Iran. And it actually worked. I mean, I'm not saying it was easy, but, but it worked all the while while we were disagreeing about Ukraine. So I don't think that the fact that we have to work also with the Russians on Syria, it will necessarily lead to a, an overall rapprochement. My, my, my hope is rather that, I mean, Putin has in that sense been successful that because he has intervened, it is not impossible to remove Assad from power immediately. Any compromise that will now be made any new power sharing deal will, will be with Assad, at least temporarily. In that sense, he can say that he has, he has achieved um, something. Will that allow him, that sort of gain of face, to quietly draw down on Ukraine without losing too much face? Because I think that's his problem, that he has nothing to offer to his public opinion. I mean, economically, Russia is on a downward path. He cannot promise anything. 
accepts status, prestige, nationalism. And that, of course, makes it difficult to compromise on Ukraine. So could the one influence um, the uh, ability? I'm not saying, I mean, for sure, he will keep the Crimea. And I think we, in the Minsk process, have quietly already said, you know, we will not recognize it, but we won't talk about it. It's yours. I'm a f I, I, I doubt that he will fully respect the Minsk agreement and restore control of the external borders to the Kiev government, but at least he could phase out quietly. He doesn't need to say it. He can just do it military support to the enclaves uh, in, in the East. In Europe, this remains difficult because those who are closest to Russia are more skeptical of Russia. There's no need to, um, to hide that. But I think overall, the EU objective remains to somehow have a constructive relationship with Russia because they are our neighbors. You, know, you can't choose your neighbors. You don't have to love them, but you better have a good neighborly relationship with them. But that has to work both ways, of course. They have to want it. All right, why don't we throw this open to questions from our audience here as well as from the virtual audience. Again, if you're watching this on the internet or in the seminar rooms, you can tweet your questions to hashtag EU security. Are there any questions here in the room? Yes, sir, please. Let me remind everybody, if you're in the room and asking a question, please press and hold the microphone in front of you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, we have heard uh, recently some voices that they ask for the creation of a European uh, army. Uh, Mr. Juncker uh, told that, Mr. Schulz told that. Uh, what is going to be happen? Look, I mean, in principle, they are right. I mean, if you would start from scratch today, would you build 28 separate armies with the budget that you have? Probably not. It would make perfect sense to, to build one integrated army. Um, but, but we're not starting from scratch, right? Um, so I agree that this is the ultimate long-term goal, but, but the best can be the enemy of the good. I think there are many steps that can be taken, and, and talking about the European army makes it easier for those who are against the smaller steps to shoot them down also by, by using the, the, the phantom European army, especially in the United Kingdom. I think we need to do two things. Um, first, we need to continue cooperation in smaller regional clusters, but then it has to go really far. There is a lot of multilateral military cooperation in Europe, but many of these are just talking shops. What you really need is permanently integrated forces in smaller clusters, where you keep the way the Belgian and Dutch navies are integrated, where you keep your platforms national, you know, a ship in our navy is either either has a Dutch flag and a Dutch crew or a Belgian flag and a, and, a, and a Belgian crew, but everything behind the ships, command and control, training, maintenance, logistics, either is integrated permanently or it's specialized with divided tasks. That creates real effects of scale. Then you can really save money. So this you can do in various smaller clusters in all the forces. But if you say we also need our own enablers to allow us to act autonomously, at least in our broad neighborhood, you know, e even if the Benelux countries, we merge our armies, we're, we're not going to build a new aircraft, right? We're not going to build a carrier or a submarine. So if you want enablers, those can only be done at the EU level. And I think the best place to do this is not NATO. It, it is the European Union with the European Defense Agency because it's a European shortfall that has to be solved by European cooperation. So that, that's at that level, you can build European enablers. And what people are now thinking of is to use money from the EU budget because money enabling capabilities are dual use, you know. Um, my view is that if, if nine member states decide to build a drone for observation, well, the European Union can, the Commission can use a drone to observe borders, refugee streams, etc. And they, if they take part in a capability project as if they were a 10th member state and they fund their part of the capability and afterwards get their part of the capability, why, why be against that? It will just help us to reach the, reach the critical mass. So th that's, I think, the two levels at which we, we ought to be going somewhere. Eventually, I can see a core group of member states that will go so far at both levels that they will move very close to one European army. But it will be a smaller group. Maybe those who tried this project in the 50s, you know, the original six, or the original six plus Poland, I can see that happening in 10, 20 years, maybe. Yes, sir, please. And let me ask you, please identify yourself. Hi, Dr. Sven. Uh, Kevin Copsey from the UK. Uh, it's just a question about uh, Francois Hollande. He's just 
uh, called for the mutual defence yes. uh, agreement as part of the Lisbon Treaty. So it's the EU's equivalent of the Article 5. Uh, and I find that a really interesting development rather than going down the, down the NATO route. Do you think that this will be the, the litmus test to see if Europe can unite and go against not just ISIS but also the other security threats as well? It's, I mean, I did not expect this at all, but I think it's very clever. Because, I mean, what, what, what we're after is not necessarily more military capabilities or to, to greatly expand our military operations. I think the point is rather that we should force our supposed allies and partners in the region to step up their military operations. Because in the end, ISIS is not a vital threat to Europe, in my view. I mean, no terrorist attack will topple a European democratic government. Um, but it is a vital threat to some of the regimes in the, in the region. And so it's their primary responsibility to defeat ISIS on the ground. So I think the challenge now is to, to pressurize them into doing that. Wh whereas actually some of them, from some of them, still today resources are flowing to, uh, to ISIS. And then we can, of course, if there are effective ground operations, then we can support those all the more effectively with our air forces, uh, plus some presence on the ground, forward air controllers, special forces, and, and so on. But I definitely would stay very clear from large-scale ground operations, European or American. I think we have to make it clear this is a war between the states of the region and the sort of anti-state that threatens all of those states, rather than a war between Muslims and non-Muslims, which is what ISIS wants to wants to make of it. So I think what François Hollande, what, what we can get from activating this mutual solidarity clause, the point is not that it will make a military difference because we are already fighting this war, right, for a year or so. I think the point is that I, I see two things. One, uh, what we don't have in Europe, but absolutely don't have, is a common view on, on, the, on the region. And this is why we have until now been unable to play that diplomatic role in trying to put pressure on our allies. There was a meeting of, of David Cameron, Hollande and Angela Merkel on Syria, and all they could do was agree to disagree. I think by increasing the stakes now, that forces us, I hope, to change that. And you can see that Hollande himself has already changed his stance on Assad, because he didn't want to talk with him, but now he is accepting that. The other thing is related to internal security, and I hope that this can create a major push to create some systematic integrated intelligence cooperation in Europe, of which there is not much. Perhaps not intelligence cooperation overall, foreign intelligence, but certainly intelligence to protect the European uh, territory. Maybe also cooperation for you know, special and, and larger scale police operations, because some member states have limited capability. So I think, I hope that, and, and these are things that only the EU can offer, that you cannot do through NATO. So I think NATO's Article 5 remains crucial in deterring, you know, let's say, classic armed aggression, but it's in a way just one dimension of this broader mutual assistance that the EU is now actually seen to imply, right? This is, this is one dimension of it. I hope, therefore, that we don't just use this to, to now deal with the current crisis, but we, that it leads to some structural consequences, uh, notably in terms of intelligence cooperation and probably strategic planning, uh, collective strategic planning. Yes, please, Joel. Thank you. Uh, you have to press and hold, I think, Joel. Okay. There you go. Thank you, uh, Joel Hillison. Uh, my question was about the Schengen Agreement and the pressures on that with the current crisis, and how does that um, overlay with the aspirations for increasing cooperation for internal border security? I, I mean, I, uh, the thing is with, with European policies, they're not as easily abolished as many people seem to think, right? Uh, during the Eurozone crisis, everybody seemed to think, oh, now we're going to abolish the Euro. Well, you know, try to abolish a currency when that's the currency you have. Um, the, the EU is not going to collapse as quickly as that. And I think the same about Schengen. It's by now so ingrained, it's so useful, not just for people traveling, but, but for business. Um, I, I can see increased security, but not abolishing the Schengen system. And I noticed that, I mean, there are many populist voices who want that. Um, but I saw that François Hollande, in his formal statement about it, he called for more security on the outside borders of Schengen. He didn't call for the abolishment uh, of, of Schengen. And I, so I don't expect that. And in any case, we should not forget 
uh, in, in many recent terrorist attacks, I mean, the, the perpetrators are, are, are born and bred, born and raised in the country. So even with closed borders, they live there. <laughs> so what, 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 what are you going to do? Just to, fo just to follow up to that, what about strengthening Schengen? So, for exact, uh, example, uh, allowing military and law enforcement to move more quickly and easily across borders in case of major uh, internal issues. Yeah, yeah, I think that, for example, could, uh, linking back to, to your colleague's question, that could be a, a consequence of this invocation of mutual assistance, that you create more mechanisms for that. Think about the manhunt that was going on now for the perpetrators from, from Paris. Um, uh, clearly, that's a cross-border issue, and not, ev not every country involved has the same capacity, or certainly not to deal with similar, t with simultaneous contingencies like that, right? I think there was another question here. Jay? Jay? Uh, Dr. Biskop, you, you made an interesting observation earlier just with, uh, in regards to Russia and Syria and Ukraine, as those are kind of holding actions just to, so Russia can hold so they won't lose anything else, whereas, you know, we, are, we I would say we as Americans here kind of tend to view those as aggressive actions. If, if those actions by Putin are holding actions, I mean, what do you think is next for him uh, as far as East European security is, are the Baltics a threat or some other area or, I mean, what do you think their intent is in, for the region? In my, in my view, there is no, no real Russian threat to EU or NATO territory today because from the Russian point of view, Ukraine is almost like a domestic issue for them. Of course, we don't accept that, that view, right? But that's how they view it, which explains on the one hand why he is willing to take heavy punishment over it, the sanctions, which together with the low energy prices really hit Russia hard. But on the other hand, it also explains why it's not a precedent for Poland or, or the Baltics, right? I think the only limit there is, and I think Russia has made that clear, that if we decide, would decide to escalate things in Ukraine, he might just decide to escalate by moving into another theater, and then the Baltics come, come into play. But I don't think for now there is a real Russian threat to our territory. Of course, it's important that NATO took the reassurance measures that we took, which I think are also, to a large extent, a message to ourselves, right? To, to give ourselves the, the self-confidence that we need to then engage in crisis diplomacy and the sanctions that is actually dealing, dealing with this crisis. I don't think there's any military solution to this crisis. But there is a moral dilemma here in the sense that we encourage Ukraine to, to change, to become more democratic, to see closer relations with us. And now that Ukraine is in a way being punished for that by the Russians, we are only willing to go so far to help them, right? So that is a dilemma for them, but there is no clean answer to that. We're not going to go to war over Ukraine, right? I was there, I mean, a few, year, a few weeks ago, I gave this same lecture at the National Defense University in Kiev. Um, and, and, and of course, I think people there are very much disappointed with both NATO and, and the EU. Uh, but we are not going to go to war to, to keep Ukraine in, our, uh, in, in, a, in, our, in a close relationship with us. Dr. Biscop, um, thank you for coming. Uh, Colonel Andy Miltner from uh, Seminar 18. Uh, along those same lines, um, and uh, I apologize for my bluntness, but um, you know, your, your argument begs the question, what is the EU willing to go to war over? So what, what in your assessment, what is, what is the EU's tolerance for, say, the next uh, threatening of a, of a uh, you know, a, a, a Russian enclave, if you will, in some Eastern Bloc country that, uh, that Putin decides to, he wants to go in and capture? Bluntness is good, and I, 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 I like to speak for military audiences, so that's okay. They're easily provoked, uh, but you have to take the crossfire, of course. Uh, <laughs> I know that. Um, I think the line is clear. I mean, Ukraine is not a member state. It's not in NATO, it's not in the EU. So it's an entirely different ballgame from the Baltic states or Poland. It's entirely different. But I also think that we... I, I see a lot of confusion in the debate, also in, in Europe, eh, under this notion of hybrid warfare or the hybrid threat. And, and I hear a lot of people talk as if Poland or the Baltic states are as vulnerable as Ukraine. Well, they are not. The Russian hybrid tactics work in Ukraine because the country is divided and because of a sizable part of the population in the East was predisposed towards Russia. So the Russian narrative works for them 
find me one Pole who could be attracted by this Russian narrative. I mean, they've been genetically modified to be anti-Russian almost, right, by, by their history. So it do, the, this supposed hybrid threat does not apply in this same way to, to, uh, to an EU or NATO member state, in my view. At the same time, I should point out that we are at war in the Middle East, together with the United States, um, against, against I, uh, ISIS. I know a lot of comments in, uh, in Europe, people say, oh, the Hollande has declared war. Well, we've been fighting this war for a year, right? We just didn't call it a war, but I think we started bombing ISIS with the conscious aim of, of uh, uh, wiping them from the map. I, I would call that a war. Only it's a limited effort on our side because we think that is the our should be the, the responsibility of our supposed allies in the region to fight that war on the ground because they're actually more threatened than, than, than we are. But, but it is a war. Europeans are engaged uh, in, in, in Mali, for example. I mean, they were able to keep the operation to a limited scale by acting quickly and early, notably the French. Uh, so I'm not saying that the problem is uh, is gone away, but it's been contained and it, it can be kept uh, kept under under control. So I would not uh, I would not minimize the the will to to use force when when necessary, but clearly. We, we see it more, I say, we see the last resort being further away than I think in the strategic culture here. That, 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 that remains the case for sure. Sorry, can I just take that on a little bit further? Because um, certainly from experience, it seems to me that an EU defence policy, that ability to be expeditionary to deliver a military effect to date has been slightly more reactionary rather than preemptive. So, for example, uh, in Mali, it was the French unilaterally that went in, yep. and then as it stabilised, you took over. If you then look at NATO's actions in the Balkans, NATO went in very quick and agile, and then handed over to the EU force, uh, again, once it's stabilised and, and relatively safe and low risk. So I suppose uh, what my comments on your, and, and I see your, your observation on is, you know, we will always try and seek perhaps the least risk, least investment in a crisis, noting that someone has already been there in that first echelon to actually deal with it because 28 Nations does not have the political agility to deal with the crisis and to come up with a common solution quick enough but to in solve that it. But in the first echelon, many of them will be Europeans, right? But, but I, I agree with your point that what we do really under the EU flag, let's say under EU command, right, that has been a, a very specific and rather narrow part towards the lower end of the spectrum most of the time. That, that, that is absolutely true. And I think, how to say, I mean, you, you need not do an EU combat operation for the fun of doing it, right? Just to prove that, that you can. So there is a slight difficulty, difficulty here. So, but part of the reason is also that some capitals have, have refused to equip the EU with the structures that would allow it to act, to be more agile, right? I leave apart that, that, that's, that they're absolutely true that uh, to find agreement with 28 about a rapid deployment will always be difficult, although sometimes we can do it. Operation Atalanta, the naval operation, which is commanded by the UK, works. Um, but if you don't have your own command structure and you have no guarantee you can use another one, that, that, leaves, that, that leaves you handicapped. What I think we are missing um, is is easier access to the command structure that we have in the alliance. Just look at the Libya campaign, which I know is not, was not an EU operation, uh, but initiated by Britain and France, then with launched with the, with the United States. Um, I know there was a bit of a tussle about which command structures to use. The US imposed that it should be NATO, and then Turkey said, no, it can be NATO. And the US had to lean very heavily on Ankara just to allow our own command structure to be used. I mean, th that, that is just not acceptable. And if you want the EU headquarters debate to go away, then we need to fix, fix that problem, to have guaranteed access for whichever format, I mean, whichever constellation you want to intervene militarily, but that you have access to the command structure. So my point is that, let's say, to deal with a crisis the, the, at the political strategic level, the EU is the best place because there you look at the broad spectrum, right? 
But if, as part of your answer to a problem or a crisis, you decide to take under military action, my plea is not to always do it necessarily under EU command. I think you then have to choose the command structure that is best suited to the case at hand, depending on the nature of the task, depending on who wants to join, depending also on the politics. I think, for example, that to intervene in Syria under the NATO flag would be very unwise. It would just be counterproductive, right? That just the politics, that's just the case. So that not to, I'm not trying to push everything inside the CSDP, quite, quite the contrary. But then we have to accept that EU strategy, that all the other items can also be instruments of what we do as EU. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Kinsey, Seminar 3. Um, migration is not a new issue for the EU by any stretch of the imagination. The, the current wave, uh, there have been waves before that, mostly economic. And it is a huge financial uh, burden among other types of burdens for the member states. Um, obviously, much more concern for the southern states than some of the others, although there are certain cities in France that would argue that they have a, a major problem as well. In the, in the long term, how is e, the EU planning on dealing with the successive waves of both refugee and economic migrants? I mean, I would not, I mean, I would call the current wave is atypical, right? That's, that's because of the, of the wars going on. And what strikes me is that the debate in Europe is mostly about how to take care of people who have arrived in Europe and how to stop the others from entering but there seems precious little debate about, well, why are people coming? And how can we take away the, that the cause that makes them come? And basically, that means now that someone has to take control of Libya. I mean, Li Libya has, has almost more governments than Belgium, and that's saying something. Um, and, and, and the war in Syria and Iraq has to end. If those, that, that are the two great push factors now. And, and because of this wave now that, that sort of inundates us, that creates an opportunity. So all of a sudden, the number of people who come from Afghanistan has gone up massively again because they just see the opportunity, so they come, and from, and from further afield. So if you don't deal with the war in Libya and the war in Syria and Iraq, this current uh, crisis will remain at, at that level. Once you are able to deal with them, you will, go, you will always have migration, but, but at a manageable scale, like we managed it, like we managed it before. But we probably have to think about uh, a system like the United States and Canada have, where we, we, I think we have no choice but to allow a certain degree of legal economic migration. That, that, that creates another process and that deflicts some of the energy and attention. People try to get into that process legally. Uh, and plus also then you can, uh, let's, let's be honest, be, be uh, in a way selective and try and recruit people that you need, because Europe, I mean, few politicians dare to say it, but we need migra economic migration for our labor markets, giving the agent, aging population, we, we need it. Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Thigpen, uh, Air Force uh, Reserves, actually. So looking at the uh, migration that you've got going into, um, into Europe, why are these, is there any mechanism that you guys can use with the Arab member states to encourage migration south versus north. Um, I mean, they've got needs down there as well in the uh, Arab states for TCNs to do their labor. Um, why are they heading north? Why won't they go south? Because they, the feeling is that, that the, the welfare state is better developed. It's as simple as that. Um, people are going where they think conditions are, are better, or they are going where they already have communities of compatriots, right? In countries like Poland, for example, there are by until now very little people of any uh, North, North African or Arab origin, for example, uh, and, and also conditions, social conditions are not as developed as, for example, in Sweden or Norway, not in the member state, but, but which have large communities already. So that, that acts as a, as a pull factor. But there is no, the, I mean, the commission tries to impose a plan to spread people, but We've all seen how difficult that, that was. There is now some agreement so that it's the, the, the burden is more, more equally balanced in function of what, what countries can afford. I must say, I think Hollande was very courageous by, by saying today that France 
that he will refuse to make the link between the terrorist attacks and the refugees, and that France will still accept 30,000 refugees from Syria. Uh, I think that's a very noble gesture, a very courageous gesture, but he is, he is right. We have, a, we have certain, certain duties, you know. And if, I mean, if you look at the histories of Europe, it's not, you know, people are still living who were part of refugees themselves, you know. Nicolas Sarkozy, you know, he comes from a refugee family, you know, from Hungary in the 50s. Um, my grandparents were refugees in the 1940s. You know, they, they, they fled to France before coming back, so it's not that long ago, so perhaps we should, but I know that memory is always short, but perhaps we should point this out. Yes, sir. Hi, Peter Fechtel, uh, Seminar 12. I was wondering if you could comment on uh, the consolidation that's been going on in the European defense industry. Uh, you, you have some primary players, BAE, Talis, uh, Rheinmetall. Um, I think the most recent uh, merger I saw was between Talis and uh, Kraus uh, Magvai Vefman uh, in, in southern Germany. Is this a good thing for, for the European defense industry to have only a few key players, or was diversity with a lot of corporations that could develop different, very high quality products a, a better thing for, for the European Union? I think we have no choice but to go for consolidation because our national markets have become so small. You know. The old model whereby a company could be a national champion and, and, and thrive by just supplying its own government, there's very few who can do that anymore. I mean, even the archetype of that is Dassault in France, even they can't, can't survive uh, anymore. And you see the situation that, that we then get ourselves in with. You know, we produce four different fighter aircraft, and there's no market for, for, for any of them. Certainly not if the market is flooded with the F-35. But, uh, <laughs> um, but I mean, it, it just doesn't, doesn't make sense. You know, the scale has become too small. I think in aerospace, actually, it's one of the most consolidated sectors. But in, in land and in major land platforms, it's one of the least consolidated sectors. I think industry is, not all of it, but major players in industry are shifting. They want more consolidation, uh, and they want the more integrated demand, because otherwise they just don't have the capacity. Um, but I think many states are still very protectionist uh, in the end, you know. And they, they don't buy what they need or when they need it, but they buy what their national industry produces when that industry needs orders. And I mean, that's, of course, pretty, um, pretty wasteful. It's dangerous. I mean, the, the CEO of, uh, of Airbus, uh, Anders, said at the EDA's annual conference last year, uh, he said, look, I can close the military part of Airbus. I can close it. It will hurt the company for a short while. And the good people I will keep, I will move them to the civilian side. I'll have to lay off some people. But Airbus will survive. But once I close it, it will never come back. So either you give me orders and, and you can keep a military aerospace industry, or not, and then we will always rely on mostly on the United States. That's a choice to be made. If you accept, if we accept that, then then we accept that. In all honesty, I think it would be wiser to also have a European defense, technological, and industrial uh, base. But it's moving at a snail pace, unfortunately. Yes, sir. Sir, Doug Borman, Seminar 16. Uh, the United States started out as kind of a loose confederation of states, and, uh, and we wound up fighting a war to settle on whether the states had the right to do what they wanted to do. Um, that being the, the, the case, did, uh, do you think the EU should have, uh, as part of its strategy, thinking through the process of transitioning power away from the, the member states to the, to the central, or is that something you just manage as you go along? I mean, until now, and I think we have to stick with that, we have never defined the end state of this process. Because once you begin that, you will, you will disagree and it will stop you from progressing. So we've, we've, we follow what is called the Méthode Monet, after Jean Monet, or the functionalist approach, just moving step by step in different, in different areas. But for me, one thing is clear. The long-term trend does remain ever closer union. Because you see that the core players, let's say the core, the original six, France, Germany, Italy, the Benelux, they want that. That's what they want, ever closer integration. Look at all the signals coming from Paris and, 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 and Berlin. They want more integration because otherwise we cannot manage 
manage problems. Um, this may at one point lead, Juncker just said it the other day, to a more clearly delineated two-speed Europe. Now you have multi-speed. Eh? You have the Eurozone, you have Schengen. Uh, some countries have opt-outs here, sometimes there. What I think we will get at is a core that goes a whole lot further in, in, a, in, a, in a whole series of policy areas and de facto becomes a bit of a core. It could be a big core, the Eurozone, because it's naturally uh, once you start harmonizing your budget, your banking rules, etc., you have to begin about to think about harmonizing your fiscal system. You have to begin thinking about your social system. It doesn't make sense that member states compete against each other by lowering taxes for companies. Uh, that, that just benefits the companies, it doesn't benefit the public. Or by lowering social security standards. So you should harmonize that. Um, that, that is just the next logical step in the Eurozone, and that's, that's the kind of ideas that are now coming from the French and, and the Germans. So I think that that will happen. In my view, and I think I speak for 99% of the Belgians, the ultimate goal is a European federation, which means at the European level, you, you have something that perhaps looks a little bit like the US system, whereby your European commission becomes an actual government, meaning that you create it on the basis of the result of the European elections. You create a coalition, a majority in the European Parliament, and that creates a, a, a European government, and whereby the Council of Ministers rather than becomes the Senate. If the European Parliament can be compared to Congress, your Council of Ministers become compared to the Senate. That's where I think we, we, we ought to be going. Um, this will take time, but as I said, this, in spite of all the bumps on, in the, on the road, right, some of them have been a bit more than bumps, but the long-term trend is still that, uh, in my view. All right, Sven, we began uh, this conversation with a question from me, and we'll, we'll end it with one from me also. I want to ask you, finally, about uh, what in Europe is known as the comprehensive approach and what we sometimes call the whole-of-government approach. Uh, in one of your last answers, uh, recent answers, to a question from our audience here, you mentioned having to... Uh, deal with the push factors in places like Libya and Syria and Iraq. And I think there's a consensus in the West that that is part of the solution, right? But I think there's also a growing consensus, um, at least uh, certainly in the, in the broader West, and now emerging in the U.S. If you look at public opinion polls in the U.S. and also what uh, President Obama has re said recently, that these problem sets, Libya, Iraq, Syria, are not entirely military, Right? They're really whole of government problem sets. But that toolbox has received uh, a negative, a not so positive reputation given our very recent experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan. And so I want to ask you what you think the outlook is for these kinds of approaches, for a, for a comprehensive approach as a tool in the EU, the emerging EU security strategy. That's very interesting the way you put it. Because I think if you say the words comprehensive approach on the EU side of Brussels, well, first of all, people will sigh and their eyes will roll over and say, not again, because the buzzword is a bit worn out. Um, but, but they will not associate it with Iraq or Afghanistan. They will associate it with the Horn of Africa and with the Sahel strategy, where you could say very slowly, after many trials, comprehensive approach is beginning to work. I better should, because Somalia has been in a war for, what, 20 years now. So it's, a, it's about time, right? But I think in, 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 Somalia, in the Horn of Africa, the EU is sort of learning by doing. We started with the naval operation and then realized, well, actually, this problem of maritime security will have to be solved on land. So we have a training mission, uh, development aid, capacity building, et cetera, et cetera. And after we began to do it, then we wrote it up and we produced the Horn of Africa strategy. Then we did the same. We produced the Sahel strategy. And then now we're implementing it. I'm far from you know, far from it to say that everything there is working perfectly fine, right? But I think it, it is going much better th than before. We're we're, um, we're trying to. But I think the key difference maybe is that a key part of of the public and of the key actors they want us to be there, right? If you look at Mali, I think the population wanted the French to come in and, and protect them. Uh, this is not s seen as an, uh, as an occupation. And, and that, for me, is a key difference, definitely with Iraq, and eventually became one with, 
with Afghanistan, uh, uh, I, I think. So, yeah, you have, you have no choice. I mean, I, I don't like to use the word comprehensive approach that much because for me it's implicit in grand strategy that it's all of government. I think that's a point of, of, uh, of grand strategy that I know that bureaucracies have to come up with, with new words, you know, and, and now in Brussels, now it's hybrid warfare or hybrid threats, which, I mean, basically hybrid warfare is the comprehensive approach that's gone over to the dark side of the force. But, <laughs> right, it, it's, it's the same... Um, it, it's the same thing. It's not, uh, it's not something new. So it, it will remain part of the. Um, uh, it will remain the core of, of how we how we try to intervene. I think, and it will remain at the EU level difficult just because our machinery is so complex. Now, if I can end on that and link it back again to the federation question, for me, eventually, the m if as Europe integrates more closely, it would be logical to also step move away from unanimous decision making in foreign policy you know i mean so far belgium is the only country that's officially in favor of moving to qualified majority voting on foreign policy we are of course right but as long as the others don't know that we are right we're not going to get there but it makes perfect sense just like we started out with um, the whole area of justice and home affairs which is about police immigration etc started out in 92 as also an intergovernmental area but was then moved to the community area, meaning decisions by majority, by the Commission the European and the European Parliament, right? I would do the same for foreign policy, and that will already make it a lot easier to move, uh, to implement your comprehensive approach. Because you see why the EU works best is where we have majority voting, because then not every country can block, can block uh, every issue. I wouldn't say that I would, you can obviously not move in that direction for defense, as long as you have national forces, right? You can only have, have that if you have really European forces, right? But on foreign policy, why not? I think we could if we wanted to. Good point to end on. Ladies and gentlemen, Sven Biskup is the author of Peace Without Money, War Without Americans. It is literally hot off the presses. You can still feel it's still warm. Uh, published by Ashgate. I want to thank the audience here in the room for attending today, our virtual audience in seminar rooms and over the internet for watching as well. Uh, and most importantly, I want to thank Dr. Sven Biskup. Please join me in that for his enlightening presentation today. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you.